a lot of people get lost in this thought. A lot of people don't think critically about why they're doing this. And so, especially on small startups, I see this a lot. They think, oh, I need to do A. I need to copy. If I don't, I am not being professional about it. And so a lot of people misconstrue. Hello, and welcome to Behind the Game, the podcast where we talk to experts in the gaming industry. Today, we are talking to Gus Viegas, who is a marketing and monetization expert with over 10 plus years of experience at companies like Rovio and Supercell. Gus is very knowledgeable, and it's great to have him here. Gus, welcome. As someone who just did their first live talk, I would love to know, do you have any like tips to keep it interesting and like, you know, keep it going deeper, I guess? Because I've got mm, some. It is hard. Ideas. It is very fucking hard. <laughs> yeah. um, so, whew, I think uh, the body language do a lot, right? If they see you, you're on fire and you feel passion for that. And many, many times, like what I do is I, I feel I'm on fire. I start talking, I feel the passion. And <laughs> as soon as I see one guy on like one, just one guy engaging with me, I go straight at that guy, look at the, <laughs> look at his face or her face and I start bringing more the energy. So you got already two people with energy in the room and it's contagious. So the more, the more you get into it, the more the people get into, into your talk. That is excellent advice. hundred percent. I also might nowadays take two weeks to prepare a talk. Um, the, the way that I do it is I go to LinkedIn and I make a poll out of the talks that come out of my head. Like here's four topics that I could reasonably talk about. Uh, you guys decide which one. And the fact that um, I always get the audience to tell me what I should talk about uh, keeps me A, on my toes. B, I know that it's interesting. And what I usually do is a bit uh silly which is i end up just combining all topics anyway <laughs> when the poll is at least reasonably tied um which creates a problem so this is why uh, th there's a danger of going deep which is if i go deep in more than one topic it becomes an overwhelming talk yeah. but yeah. i also do that sometimes on purpose because imagine you don't want to answer questions there's a technique which is you give them so much content that the the person in the audience their brain is kind of on fire and they they're kind of like not wanting to ask anything. I've Turns done this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's funny. Yeah, and that's why it takes so long to prepare because of like each individual slide could be reasonably maybe a, a talk in and of itself to the point that by the end of let's say twenty to thirty minutes. Uh, they're just like kind of processing it still. And I was like, that was my time. Bye. <laughs> right. We, it's funny because we actually kind of use that same method, but for community management. So it's also the poll, like we kind of give a poll, even though we're going to do all of the options, but we make the community feel like they're like kind of giving, you know, they're inputting and so they're involved, but then we end up doing all of it anyways. And then, yeah, so it's definitely a good method. <laughs> For sure. Um, but I'm not sure if I actually did answer your question. I think uh, uh, his opinion here on this is exactly the right one is just be passionate about it. Um, I've started to uh, practice less. What am I saying on stage or thinking about what I say on stage and more about how I feel and how the audience must feel. Um, okay. uh, there was there was a time long ago, uh, back in my early 20s that I uh, was a DJ and it's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> okay. It, that's that's the cool. feelings of the people, not with the actual content. Yeah. Right. You feel the vibe. You need to feel the, to read the room. Right. It, it, and it's true. Cause sometimes when people prepare so much or like they sound super robotic because they want to stick to, to the script. Right. And, mm -hmm. and they're going to do like, Oh, I've been studying for this. And then it doesn't feel natural, like they really love what they're talking about, or they really feel why they want to feel that way. But it's like, that what happened to me? It was like I was in a stand-up comedy. I would take the mic, go up and down, and point point like crazy to the slides. Like, yeah, I mean, it's fun. Yeah. The good thing is that it's fun. You said you were a DJ, and so I have to ask, how did you get into the gaming industry if you were a DJ? Like, how did those two things connect? No, no, no. It was more of a part-time uh, on the side okay. kind of. Um, 
as one will, as it's not a career that, you know, sustains you right. a lot. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, at least at the start. Uh, music is very much a, a winner takes all kind of game that unless you're famous, you're not going to be making a good living. But once you do, you really do. Uh, right. It's like, let's say income inequality is even more uh, oppressive in the music industry. I used to have a lot of friends in the music industry and uh, it's... Um, let's say not the nicest world uh actually funnily enough my first mobile game was in um kind of like a spotify competitor that was trying to be a, a game uh how does this make sense is imagine you have a spotify but you have quests on listening to certain songs and doing certain actions with certain songs uh to kind of like gamify the experience and at the time I was doing, uh, well, DJ at night and board game designer by day. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, people were thinking, hey, got the people from the music industry, because this company was actually in the music industry and they were getting into apps and mobile games and mobile in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were like, who's a nerd that we know? <laughs> and my name came up and they just decided to hire me on my first, I would say, mobile uh, game uh situation uh even though at the time i was just a board game designer um so i started off as a games designer that that's how, how i started so how did that lead to your expertise in user acquisition actually it was the same job um so up until that point i thought that i was uh my career was very clearly going to be game design because i loved um the connection between different uh fields uh artists and engineers and where's the nexus of it all and in that job, uh, at the beginning, I was more responsible for the retention of the game. And one of the things that came from that is live ops. And live mm -hmm. ops effectively is, you know, the events come in uh, and you're managing the different events. And that can be uh, in both departments, both the game design department and then the marketing department that is, you know, advertising it. And being uh, uh, curious about it, I just ended up uh, hey, how are you setting up this Facebook campaign? How, hey, how does this work? Hey, how does that work? And hey, did you try this? Did you try that? Um, and sincerely, after a year of poking and prodding and a few experiments here and there, I ended up feeling that I was way better and way more suited for that job rather than the one I had. And when I came to Helsinki, I think it was a year or two later, and uh, I had to create a CV. Hey, where do I start? Where do I go next? Uh, I actually had a recruiter tell me, hey, Gus, you need to define yourself. Do you really want to go back to game design or do you want to stay, stay and actually try out this marketing? I'll be honest, I was still undecided, but I, I took a gamble more on the marketing side. And um, the the more jobs i had the more it solidified that hey actually i actually it does make sense for me that this is my path and when it crystallized was actually uh when i was doing contract work at supercell so i was there within their offices you know this is like the apex of you know game making on mobile uh, which is mm -hmm. super and i can see like the the game designers there working on clash royale on my side and i see how amazing they are and i right what's the distance right between the beginning of a career <laughs> uh, and the in-game supercell right <laughs> <laughs> and i just looked at their their desks i, I look at them in the face and i was like yeah no <laughs> this is i don't think reasonably i can make all of this journey to get there uh because and here's the kicker because at that point I had already had some successes in the marketing side. It was quite quick that I made some some epic campaigns that really changed the story of a game. Uh, and so I already had some success on one side and kind of none on the other. And I saw how much uh, one person at some point realizes their ikigai, right? Like where where right. does their talent, their skill, their passion line up? And for me, it happened to be marketing. Um, it's not, not everyone's cup of tea, <laughs> the way that I like to think about, uh, marketing is 
precisely you have these creatives that are making the games and the, they're passionate about making their game and and they're they're awesome at it but someone has to pay the bills <laughs> and so i specialize in that uh, in specifically answering <laughs> that question which is how does money come in how does money come out in a in a company and typically the out is the marketing that's where all the money goes out the door most of the time and a lot of the time when it comes in it's ad monetization and so i mm -hmm. saw my career gravitating towards helping them out and it links back to the previous conversation of uh where was i at with uh, the music industry i when i was in the music industry my my biggest concern was how do we get these artists paid and in the gaming industry it did not change i still uh, worry every single day where does the salary come from uh where does the money go and as someone who's been in a bunch of different startups throughout the years and i've seen companies fail uh and i've seen people getting laid off and this is something very present nowadays unfortunately mm -hmm. i care so much about this that i do anything to make sure that like the money is on the table for the game developers um and that, that's how i see my career a bit that's really impressive man so you you like you could pivote from from more ua to a more director role when you where you can have more power to make sure where the money is gonna go how to just manage your teams put the right resources on the right place right yes i i think this is uh the the way you asked the question actually reminds me of the trajectory one goes from junior to senior to lead to yeah. director and nc level uh you you start off very ambitiously hey i just want to do something uh <laughs> and, and when i was in portugal making board games that was literally it is i just want to do games somehow as much as humanly possible And when I came here to, to Finland and I started on my first roles after two, four years in the industry, I already started going more the senior route, which is I am still just doing, but I don't need a specific task. You just have to point me. I used to tell my bosses, just give me the compass. What is the north? And I will go in that direction. I don't need you to tell me what to do. You just need to tell me why I'm doing it. Uh, and then I'll adjust. Team lead then becomes the problem area i think for a lot of careers in which you become this interdependent nexus of there's a lot of doers on one side and a lot of thinkers on the other uh mm -hmm. and a lot of priorities that come from above and from below and you're just there to kind of connect all the dots and it's a very frustrating role to be in uh because a lot of things might go might go wrong that you had no control over and the light at the end of the tunnel Uh, is that directorial area in which I start to fit in nowadays, in which is l just like you said, the resources start to become your plaything. You start to think, okay, I need to move people around. I need to uh, move budgets around to fulfill a specific vision that I see where the company is three years from now. Uh, how do I get there? And so you're more debating for resources. You're more thinking about those resources in a higher level, but it is like maybe potentially the most fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's a hot take. I don't know if everybody would say that's the most fun, but you know, we all need people that like you that do think it's the most fun. <laughs> Because, and this leads me to the last part. What about the sea levels, right? What about the founders, the, the presidents, the stakeholders, et cetera? They, it goes back to being not so nice right after, because at yeah. that point right. you're more thinking the survival of a company. Uh, what do the investors think about? What do external factors in the market? Not that I don't consider those, of course I do, but uh, where does the budget come from even? Uh, you are dividing your attention, let's say uh, 33% on each. A uh, third on each. One is external factors, let's say the investors, stakeholders, blah, blah, blah. One other third is other departments. So if you're a CMO, uh, you're thinking about what the CTO wants for their tech requirements, what the uh, product officer wants, what the CEO wants, and their departments. And only a third in your own, right? So at that point, you're so detached from the day to day to a certain point that it stops being the thing that you got into the career in the first place for, kind of. Yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't also kind of 
uh, go off the rails at any other point in the career. But at that point, it really, truly, you need to love the business as a whole and not specifically where you come from. And at least at the moment, I feel so much passion for uh, the world of user acquisition in mobile and ad and monetization in mobile that, you know, I am where I need to be. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I am also a fellow marketer, <laughs> a little bit differently. I think I've always known that I've really enjoyed marketing. So you talked about early successes and I kind of want to know how you had those early successes. Like, uh, give me some, give me some tips, <laughs> please. Uh, again, I'm taking this from the lens of the performance marketing side. So let's be clear here that I am not by any means of the imagination, uh, an excellent uh, community manager or social media manager. I have a lot of respect for these other roles that are more uh, connecting with the people one-to-one. -one. Uh, not saying that performance marketing is not that, but I mean, come on. Uh, in the last 10 years, up until the Apple uh, apocalypse of privacy, uh, performance marketing was effectively econ economics, uh, money in, money out, like I described it earlier. It didn't really matter uh, your ideas for ads because you would just throw all of the ideas in the machine, see what, which one was good, and that's it. Yeah. Um, so I again, respect for people that actually do marketing and not just performance marketing. Uh, <laughs> that said, so early successes. Um, so it was really early on in my career. I think it was literally my first job here in Finland that, um, <laughs> so the way I got that job was uh, legitimately knocking door to door on all the gaming companies here. And there's 200 gaming companies here. So after two weeks of knocking every day on a few doors, the most old school to the point that a lot of people open the door and say, why not an email? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said, you're talking to me, aren't you? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after a couple of weeks, someone gave me a test, which was, Hey, we actually have access to a really interesting IPs. Uh, like, I think it was like Red Bull and Walking Dead and, uh, the Terminator. Uh, how would you leverage that to get users in? And, uh, imagine your budget is, let's say, uh, 20,000 or 25,000 or whatever. And we want to get millions of users, right? So immediately I hear this and I'm thinking, okay, so they're talking uh, cents on the CPI for maybe a US audience. This is already hard, um, but they do have brand power. Uh, they have no plan in a sense, like there was a plan, but it wasn't a super structured plan at the moment yet for the release of the game. And the game was releasing in, I think, a month and a half, maybe two months. Uh, and I was like, okay, fuck, how, how do I align all of this? <laughs> and funny enough, so this is, God damn, what year are we talking about? 2016, 2017, maybe. Uh, and uh, YouTube influencers weren't a thing yet. It, like the, it was the yeah. beginning of it, like the really beginning of it. And I was an avid YouTube watcher, like still am, unfortunately, to this day. Uh, multiple hours, unfortunately, to this day, uh, every day. And Me too. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I love YouTube. Is, <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I replaced it with TikTok. No, I just add a TikTok on top. So Same. I watch more YouTube than I watch, like, TV, for sure. I'm a YouTube watcher. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Hands down. It's, it is what it is. Um, yeah. So as someone who is very passionate about YouTube and someone who – saw the potential in it. And uh, I decided to go the influencer marketing route uh, for this particular project. And what I did was I calculated, okay, so if this is my target CPI, and this is what I believe is a reasonable enough conversion rate, let's say for an ad, you, you have a conversion rate of 1%, 2%, whatever. Let's assume it's the exact same conversion rate. So 2%, let's say. So you know how many views they get on each video. You know what's your conversion rate and you know what CPI you want. That immediately gives you what's your price range. Like what's your cost per, per thousand impressions that you want to target. So I did this in reverse. I made 
kind of a script that crawled on messages on YouTube uh, telling them, hey, this is exactly how much I'm willing to pay for your video on this, let's say, Terminator video or on this Red Bull video or whatever. Uh, this is how much I'm willing to pay. Uh, this is how much, uh, this is how to contact me. This is actually an asset package that you can use to talk about the game, like videos of the game that we had prepared and assets for the game they had prepared. Um, again, like apologies for the cold email or the cold message or whatever, but I mean, it, it's here if you want it. Um, and after uh, working with them, and in some cases, unfortunately, their agencies, uh, I'd say unfortunately because the agencies always take a cut. And nowadays, yeah. I would say almost every YouTuber is protected by agencies. Uh, and by protect, I also mean kind of their prices go up, but not much value is added to the end advertiser. I still <laughs> mm -hmm. very passionately <laughs> about contacting one-to-one -one with the YouTuber. Uh, yeah. It's a lot extra work for the advertiser, but uh, it shows on the video that the quality, the passion that they put behind that one-to-one -one connection that they have with you. Right. And so I launched the bait. And so at the end of it, we were talking 350 um, influencers uh, that were willing to talk on launch day for the price that I wanted. So 350, and again, this is one month of time that uh, was between having the idea, doing the math, sending the emails, contacting them, and scheduling them all to launch on the same day, and all by... That's a lot of work, so congrats. That's not no. a lot of time. No, and again, one human being contacting 350 yeah. human beings, and, and uh, this is the moment in my career that I coined the term hurting cats, like working with influencers is hurting cats because they were like, oh, my grandmother ate my homework. I can't do the video. Uh, so it was really hard to get them in the same moment doing the same thing or at least something that would make sense. But we still did it. And the results were fucking amazing. Like, honestly, we got a million users on the first month. Um, so that gave us effectively like a 25 cent CPI on US users on the launch. Uh, so it was immediately like a great result. And now that it's been, you know, uh, 10 years of a career, I start to see a pattern on all the moments that were epic, like all the moments that really made a difference. And the pattern for me, at least is you gotta do something new. You really do. Uh, I don't know what exactly it is. It depends on the, the skill set of the, the person doing it. But it has to be new. So at the time, there weren't many people focusing on influencer marketing and way less even focusing on the smaller YouTubers that have never seen money in their face ever before. So I could tell them, hey, I'll pay you 50 bucks for a video. And they would go, oh, my God, 50 bucks. I've never seen money before. That's amazing. Because it was maybe like a, an 18 year old making the video. And so for them, Oh my God, 50 bucks. This is my first time earning from making a YouTube. For me, I, I'm getting a channel that has very passionate viewers. Maybe it, it has 3,000 users, but those 3,000 are hyper uh, passionate about every single word that person says. So at the time, we even, with some of them, the ones that worked really well on the first go, we then went back to them and said, hey, we are going to put uh, custom clothing for our 3D characters in our game inspired by this YouTuber so that their communities can come in and make the equivalent of guilds or clans within the game uh, to represent their favorite YouTuber to really establish that connection in a longer term and make the retention be quite high for the users that came from that. So all of this to say... At the time, people weren't doing this suit a lot, but I did not let that be a block to doing this. And after that, it was just hard work, like after coming up with that. It's interesting to say that you, you know, you tried something new and you almost were like a pioneer in influencer marketing, which is really cool for me because that's something that I do a lot. I do a lot of influencer marketing. And you were talking about the struggles now that there's so many people that are protected protected, I'm going to say, by agencies. Mm -hmm. And um, really, it doesn't do anything except for make more streamlined, like make more things 
uh, feel automatic, I guess, or like just repetitive. Like you see the same ad for the same or different video games every day, even though it's the different games, but it's like the exact same thing. Um, so, you know, how, and that also, I think that works with UA ads the same, you know, like you see the same ad, but for different games, yeah. how can you stay away from that? That's a loaded question because uh, we were talking earlier about uh, my, my talks at Games Forum and I coined the term there of clone army that uh, working in performance marketing nowadays is fighting against the clone army is yeah. not just uh, you advertise your game with your gameplay and your theme. There will be copycats immediately uh, if you are successful and for instance, uh, Last year, I uh, had the privilege of working with, uh, at, for Eat Venture, which was a game that went crazy with the numbers. And copycats were a dime a dozen. We had at least 20 games that were almost a one-to-one -one rip of the game. Um, so you have to fight with that. That's, that's right. the most obvious uh, clone army part. But then you also have all the advertisers, as soon as one ad works, Every advertiser of other games is going to fake their game to look like yours, is going to fake your their ad to look like yours, is going to fake everything to look the same. Uh, and then in general, there's these overarching trends in, in UA creatives that just get copied over and over and over again. So there's almost no originality. And if there is, it will cease to be quite soon. Um, my advice at the time and is actually, I said the time, but it was like a month or two ago, uh, is maybe beat it to the punch, uh, make it so that whatever you do is a system. And that system is effective to the point that I'm not saying the thing where you're copying trends really fast. That's not what I'm saying inherently. I'm saying that if you are going to copy, that's one of your streams of ideas the 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 cloning part keep that as a process that is so automated that you're not even thinking about it and you're not wasting time or resources or brain power on it that is exists that's here it's kind of necessary because it does give you a steady stream of numbers that make that are reliable but those are not the numbers that are going to give you success those are not the numbers that are the, that are going to excite people into playing your game rather than someone else's game so the reason I say let's make this part seamless is so you have the brain capacity to come up with new ideas. You need to waste time in your ideas because a lot of them are going to fail. A lot of them are going to be uh, too much to execute. And so they're going to take time. Uh, and it might be that you're months trying to come up with one amazing idea that uh, opens up the game completely. Uh, one trailer, uh, one mention, one story arch, something that makes sense for your marketing campaign. Uh, but it doesn't come cheap. It really doesn't. But you do need yeah. something now. So rather have a pipeline that is very reliable of the clone army, your own version of the clone army, uh, to fight against the rest of the clone army. Uh, but, <laughs> okay. But then you need your own uh, thing to stand on your two legs on uh, so you become the flavor of the month that everyone else copies uh, because that gives you an inherent advantage you're riding the top of the wave as it's uh, unfolding and uh, over and over in my career I've seen this being the first has so many advantages being the second always puts you at a disadvantage even if you're the fastest second in the world you're still at a disadvantage and at that point, you either do it so much better than the other, in which you still put effort in, or, uh, or not, or not, you're just behind. <laughs> so, rather be the first. But it's not easy. Yeah. And do you think, like, because this is this it seems like this is everywhere in the industry? I, I mean, personally speaking, I think the lack of the creativity games themselves. Is like, yeah. Yeah, it's like the, the lack of creativity in new games, in new mechanics, in a lot of things, new user interfaces that most of them are the same or copied, which works, yeah. of course. But yeah. it's it seems like everything is related in the industry because yeah. we're focusing too much on performance and we're starting to forget a little bit more about how we make the user feel or how we build yeah. the story. Right. And Very it's all about the money. 
So mm -hmm. how do you how do you see this trend? Uh, do you think it's gonna go more, or do you think we're gonna get to a point that it's gonna it's gonna explode and say, okay, fuck it, it's not working anymore to copy everything, <laughs> and and you you really need to find a new idea, or do you think that it's gonna be a trend that is gonna last for the next? That is, that is an excellent years? question. That is an excellent question because, uh, and funny enough, I think that you already got your answer. So we've, we've seen, unfortunately, a lot of layoffs over the last few months, um, years, even I would say, and I think, and, and I wrote a series about this. You might've seen it on, on LinkedIn. My theory is that this is the consequence of lack of innovation. So yeah. I, Four years, four years, companies have been fo so focused on their bottom line that they forgot mm -hmm. why they are a company in the first place. So if you are making a game studio, you're making a game studio. You're not making a game studio, uh, by which I mean the business is a consequence, not the forefront. I know that obviously... And again, referencing the talk about being a sea level and you're thinking about all the money and how distant you are from the actual thing, this is the consequence, right? It's all, again, like you said, it's all connected. If you are so considering the, the profits, of course, you're not going to take risks because you only see the numbers. You are an economist at that point and you're going, hey, I want something that will give me X amount of money. I've seen that game do X amount of money. I'm going to copy that game because I also can make that. Uh, but they forget that, again, being the second one, it's not just a disservice to the players, and it is. It's a disservice to your own bottom line because you're going to get lower numbers. It doesn't matter if you see uh, Monopoly Go right now being uh, topping the charts and making uh, un uncalculable amounts of money. If you make Monopoly Go now, you suck. Like, you, you're not going to get... <laughs> Two billion. Yeah. You're not gonna make two billion like they did because they already did it. So what's right. the point of copying? Sure, maybe you get two million. Great. You got some money, you got some business. Amazing. Would you have gotten and sorry for the effect? <laughs> <laughs> I, they just really agree with what you're saying. They're like, yes. <laughs> the, the AI gods have have agreed. <laughs> um so um Imagine you make this game, you get 2 million. But if you make a new game that uh, is, you never, everyone has ever seen, what, what are the, the potential scenarios here? You might make a game, it fails spectacularly, great. Maybe you didn't waste too many resources on it. Uh, to the point that maybe you spend one year and you make 10 games, 10 prototypes or MVP games, so not, yeah. not finished games, right? One of them, is probably going to be better than that clone. Like at, at the very least, one of those is going to be better than a game. The difference is, and again, this is why this happens, unfortunately. Out of those 10, you don't know which one is going to succeed. But if you clone, you know it's going to succeed to a certain extent. So yeah. that becomes an economical decision. Do I want to take a low risk, low reward or a high risk, high reward? And unfortunately, a lot of people, maybe due to their their fear of people losing jobs and so forth, or their own paycheck or whatever, they make these safe decisions. But it ends up biting you uh, later because if your company uh, keeps on pumping out game after game after game that ends up being the same game, reskinned, refactored, refemed, whatever, um, or it's a copycat factory, None of those is going to be the hit game that is going to uh, allow you to expand the company and hire new people and sustain uh, jobs and salary increases and, and, the, and the so forth. And instead, what happens is your company is dwindling and dwindling and dwindling, which yeah. means you need to cut costs in some capacity. And so layoffs happen. So yeah. it, the gamers lose because they have a worse game. Uh, the, the executives lose because they now have to cost cut and who loses the most are actually the game developers who got fired. So who should let start the chains and from where, like, for example, like, do you think it is something more that investors should change or because 
from what I understand, right? If you're a studio, you're a small studio, you're opening, you have a dream, whatever, you're going to need money. And the people who's going to give you the money, they're look, looking only at the, at, at the metrics, how it's going to perform and everything. Well, so who should be the first line who should make the change that is going to, that is going to convert into all the other lines changing, right? Okay, so now I've been talking about big executives, right, that have large budgets to work with. If you're talking about an indie developer or even, let's not even say indie, let's say startup developer that has some money and some resources, but not a lot of it, uh, then it becomes a different equation. It becomes, oh, fuck, we need a bit of money. We need to do something to uh, succeed. And so maybe we're going to play it safe uh, so that we have enough budget to then do the thing that we really want to do, the passion project. Um, I see why this decision is made. It makes a lot of business sense to then get the resources. The problem is that uh, power corrupts, right? So they succeed with that copycat. And then they go, oh, now we need to sustain the copycat game that we made. And so... Oh, and we actually already did one. We can do another. <laughs> so, but it, it's it's a little bit like a human centipede, centipede, or right? whatever it's going to be, right? It's like it's the same one and shitting on on each other. Because at the end of the day, I, I believe like they ha- they have this choice of going for a copy one to then start with the dreaming project because they're not getting support. I don't know, for example, from the government, from hubs, like so. It's like uh, they shitting on each other <laughs> to a point that the last one only can just shit. They cannot okay. anymore. To, to put it politically <laughs> correct, uh, kind of. Uh, again, it's a clone army. It's uh, let, let's think about it like this: you see, a company over there is doing very well, and they're doing A, and you're like, "Oh fuck, I need to do A because A is where the money is." Yeah. And a lot of people get lost in this thought. A lot of people don't think critically about why they're doing this. And so, especially on small startups, I see this a lot. They think, oh, I need to do A. I need to copy. If I don't, I am not being professional about it. And so a lot of people misconstrue uh, copying with, um, with being professional, with being serious about the business side. Instead of thinking that they need something to stand out because we're competing with a global audience, and you need to give something that people haven't seen before, or else your business is not even going to take off of the water. And and this is exactly why I see a lot of companies fail, a lot of startups fail, is because either A, they don't have enough ambition to get to that step, to envision themselves as doing something completely new, or, and this is something I also want to talk about, if there's any uh, real game developers out there listening to this, lowly businessman uh here um what happens is that typically the true indies that want to do a game just out of passion and there's a lot of them for sure they don't know anything about business so the reverse problem is they do something so unique and so original but they forget to base themselves off of some common language that the end user will understand, the marketing campaigns will understand, the the way that they communicate will understand. So the, the, the secret sauce here is actually to have a bit of both, is you aim to do something original, but you need to have some frame of reference or some way to communicate it that people will just understand. This is why a lot of the, the time in the PC console space, you hear a lot of, Oh, this is World of Warcraft, but with pigs. Mm-hmm. Like uh, you yeah. add two words together and splash them yeah. into something. There's a reason f- for that to be a thing, is because that frame of reference really helps. But you can't get lost on it either, right? And another thing I see, unfortunately, is people thinking that their innovation is enough. Oh, it's um, Forza, but now the car the cars are made of candy who cares like there it's a reskin of a game yeah. that exists um it, it's uh oh i i know i'm gonna come something completely original it's for as a racing game but with rockets so they fly and and then and i i i am literally making a joke out of the fact that this game exists uh and 
people might not know that that game exists because they might not have the frame of reference. They might have not played enough games, did enough market research to understand that their idea, even though they think is original, isn't. And so this goes back to, yes, keep your originality, but do enough market research, enough business research to understand, was this done already? If so, don't do it one-to-one -one copy. Has this never been done before? Okay, why wasn't it done ever before? Uh, and yeah. really be skeptical about yourself. Be honest with yourself because maybe there's a reason behind all of that. But most likely, uh, it's just that you didn't l l dig deep enough and figure it out enough because it, it, we're how many billions of people in this world? How many games yeah. are out there? There's tens of thousands coming out all the time. So the likelihood of your idea being 100% original is super low. Uh, the likelihood of an idea being similar to yours, but better, is also quite high. So you need a bit of both, the business sense and the originality. You cannot learn passion, right? But you can learn some business skills. So if you yes. have that passion to wanting to be a new game or start your own small indie studio, that's perfect. Keep it. But at the same time, be realistic. Don't be delusional and think about business, even though it might be a pain at the beginning, right? Just you can learn those skills, but you cannot learn your passion. So if just go exactly. for it. Exactly. And, and and this goes, the advice goes both ways. So if you are someone with passion, you it's hard to teach passion, really. It's hard uh, to teach passion. Yeah. Yeah. But right. business but is you, very but You can find it. You can find it. You cannot yeah. learn it, but you can find it. Yeah. But maybe you you like me believe oh i am not that creative <laughs> but i'm pretty good at business so yeah. you team up with creatives that do have that vision that do have that i i've worked with some excellent game designers throughout the years and i love them to death and i i've met some amazing people and i love protecting them this is goes back to why i feel of my career the way i do is because if you don't do not protect that vision it gets corrupted by committees, it gets corrupted by business, and it dilutes. And when it dilutes, it loses its value. Um, so you, so if you are someone that self-identifies as not creative at all, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> you can help. <laughs> you can right. help others who actually are. Um, yeah, I, honestly, the, the that's how I see things. Is it, it has to work both ways, and we have to meet yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Right. So we've talked a lot about your career throughout this conversation and you get given a lot of great insights. So we always like to ask this as our last question, but if you could go back in time and give yourself a cheat code, you know, early baby you, what mm. would your cheat code be to like excel your career much faster? It's funny because I kind of followed it uh, very wrongly. Um, <laughs> Little, little people know this, but I actually tried to make my own studio, game studio, at some point in my career, really early on, really early on. But that was kind of the problem. I wasn't ready for a variety of reasons. I was a bad leader, uh, didn't have enough frame of reference of, you know, how to make a business, all of these things that we just discussed. Um, but I would still say that the advice is try to do things your way. Try to uh, own what is only you that can do. Uh, I think that if I had sooner realized what are the things that only I can do and really focus and hone in on that instead of wasting my time trying to figure out how do I align with other people's expectations of what I think is a good thing to do. Uh, an example would be you're trying to please your boss rather than uh, trying to be excellent at what you think is ideal between those it's a no-brainer for me nowadays but maybe early on in my career i really wanted to uh fit in uh and make things good for someone else and that doesn't make sense because again only you can do you even if the skill that you have feels like everyone else has it they might not have it to the extent that you do or they might not have it in your way of doing so for instance i actually believe weirdly enough my skill is working hard uh, is doing like, again, how many people have you met that have talked to in one month for 350 influencers? Not many, I'm yeah. going to guess. Not many. No, no you're, so, a hustler. you're a hustler, man. I like, say, I don't even think I did that. Right to be honest. 
so, that's so a lot. That's, that's that kind is of the point, lot. right? So, so my unique selling point is something extremely boring, which is just doing a lot. Uh, right. But I now own it, which is terrible for my uh, sleep schedule. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, your but, sanity for sure. <laughs> yeah, you learn <laughs> how to deal. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's exactly the point. Is my cheat code for myself would figure out what it is that I do, and don't be afraid of starting your own business around that uh, unique skill. Yeah. All right. So basically, to wrap it up, it's be original. <laughs> you know, be yourself. Do it, what it you're good at. It sounds like that was the topic all along. <laughs> <laughs> for you, is, for you is like open, open your own studio with people who can work twenty two hours per day, <laughs> knocking, <laughs> you know, knocking doors Those and sending two hundred emails per day. Right. Those exist. You you have no idea of how hardworking people are in the game industry. I mean, uh, you probably do have an idea, but my point is, yeah. you always get surprised. I've heard of stories of people sleeping on their desk uh, because they oh, yeah. thought I am going to war and I need yep. our company to succeed and survive. And so I will sleep on this desk until we are the number one. I've met someone that internalized this thought and I'm not at all advocating for that. <laughs> I, I'm in, in Finland where we have a healthy work-life balance and it's great. And the rested mind comes up with better ideas. Um, yeah, sometimes you're but, there working like 16, 18, 20 hours and you don't think clearly. You think like it's no. it's like similar to when you're high, you think like you have the best ideas in the world and then you wake up the next day, you see your notes and it's what the fuck was that? You're like, you? what is this chicken scratch even <laughs> so mean? So you work last that right. eight hours, it's like you think you're super, super on the mood, on the song, whatever. But if you see it from outside, it's like, man, you're just going around with a no fucking sense of ideas. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And then that's how people should view crunch and should view working too much. It's you pay it back. You always pay it back. Uh, and the stress that you cause on yourself and others when you work too hard is the chicken scribbles that you write. But right. instead of only affecting you, you're affecting everyone around you. So work-life yeah. balance works. It does work. It matters, right? All right, Gus, thank you so, so much for being here. It was an absolute pleasure to talk with you and meet you. You're kind of, you know, a little influencer on LinkedIn. Um, and I think we had a really great conversation. So I really appreciate you being here. Cheers. This is my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, so much for watching. And if you liked this episode, please check out all of our other episodes as well. And please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And we will see you in the next one. Bye.